Welcome to the Growth Cap Podcast, where we chat with CEOs, investors, and other key industry leaders to uncover insights and strategies for accelerating growth and succeeding in business. I'm your host, RJ Lumba, Managing Partner of Growth Cap. In this episode, we chat with Brian Kim and Lee Garber of New Spring Capital, a private capital firm with approximately $1.8 billion in assets under management. The firm has four primary investment strategies, growth equity, healthcare, mezzanine, and holdings, which is their long-term buyout strategy. We hope you enjoy the show. Brian and Lee, thanks so much for uh, joining uh, today. Um, really delighted to chat with you. You know, I've, I've interacted with with New Spring in, in the past, and uh, you know, met some of the folks over there over time, and you know, really impressed with you know how the organization uh, has grown and and how you go about your business of uh, investing in companies. Um, maybe what we could do to kick off uh, for some of our audience who might not be as familiar with New Spring is if you could give us. Uh, a little bit about the um, the organization, particularly, I think what's interesting um, is uh, maybe the the roots of the organization. Uh, in that, your founders, I believe, uh, uh, you know, a decent number of, of your founders uh, are former operators. Yeah, absolutely, happy to. And, and, and this is Brian Kim. Um, I'll, I guess I'll start, Lee. Um, so, as a firm, you know, brief history: we were founded. Uh, coming up 20 years ago uh, already, I think this May, um, you know, our co-founders had the simple premise of uh, really just partnering with compelling management teams across the region uh, that were pursuing massive market opportunities. And uh, over time, what we've done is we've parlayed the success of that first strategy into what we are today, uh, which is really a family of, of four distinct and I'd say non-competitive investment strategies, all focused on the lower mid market. Uh, all have a natural uh, strong bias towards investing close to home, right? Particularly in the mid-Atlantic, uh, but really covering a pretty expansive set of companies. So technology, growth equity, uh, healthcare. We have a mezzanine debt strategy, and then also our holding strategy, uh, which Lee helps lead, uh, that focuses on control buyouts. So all in all, uh, we have about a billion eight under management. Uh, and so far, we've backed uh, just about 150 companies since inception. Wow, that's some uh, fast growth. Um, so now, um, you know, what maybe what we could do is dive a little bit deeper into uh, each of the strategies that that you cover, and then maybe as part of that, we can get uh, some of your background. Because um, I, you know, we uh, uh, were um, happy to, um, you know, had you and feature you. As part of the uh, you know 40 under 40 list, so um, you, you know this this is an opportunity for a lot of the entrepreneurs and CEOs in our audience to get to know you uh, a little bit better. Um, Brian, did you want to start or, or uh, either way, um, either Brian or Lee? But maybe we we could go you know one after yeah, the Brian, other. Yeah, Brian, why don't you kick it off? Cover the equity strategies, and then I'll take sort of the other side of the house. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, you know, in terms of, of, of our focus as a firm, um, you know, I'd say our approach is pretty consistent, you know, across all four of our strategies. Uh, what we look for across the board are really sticky uh, recurring revenue-based businesses that have uh, developed a unique way of solving major challenges in large markets, right? So um, we're looking on top of that uh, for experienced leaders and broader management teams to drive those companies. Uh, we're looking for those teams that think of long-term value creation and the fundamentals of uh, capital-efficient growth. And then more specifically, I think just ticking through each of the four, uh, Lee, I'll cover growth in healthcare, and, and, and you, you could tackle meds uh, and buyouts. But within growth, uh, you know, we're deploying anywhere from about 10 to $30 million of equity, largely in B2B technology companies. Um, we're generally investing and partnering with companies that are doing at least the minimum of about $5 million of recurring revenue by the time we, uh, we step in. On average, uh, over those 20 years, it's been closer to about 15. And some recent uh, example investments of ours include uh, Vacasa, which is a full-service vacation rental management platform based in Portland, uh, Interactions, which is a, which is a next-generation IVR uh, technology based in Boston, as well as Exec Online, which is an enterprise-focused uh, executive education provider uh, based in New York City. Our healthcare strategy, also very growth-oriented uh, in terms of backing high-growth companies. 
They're looking to deploy anywhere from about five on the low end to about $20 million on the high end of equity uh, per investment with a large focus on uh, both healthcare technology and specialty services. So uh, Verisma, which is a cloud-based release of information automation platform is a, is a terrific example of an investment of theirs. Uh, they're based in New York, as well as SeniorLink, uh, which is a caregiver and elderly care, uh, care solutions platform uh, based in uh, the Boston area. Um, Lee, can you cover Mezzanine? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, as, as Brian said, there's a, a ton of consistency amongst what we're looking for, right? I irrespective of where our companies are in, or where our strategies fall in the capital structure, I think as New Spring goes to market, it's, you know, great management teams with great companies and the markets Brian talked about with the characteristics of efficiency and capital, et cetera, really fall um, into any one of our buckets. And so, you know, what I consider the most flexible bucket at New Spring is our mezzanine strategy. I mean, they can do yep. uh, control buyouts. Normally they don't. And if they do, they're partnering with somebody in a syndicate. Um and structure it in a way that uh, that there's more of a debt exposure than an equity exposure. Um, but they're focused on a variety of capital events at, at both private equity sponsored as well as entrepreneurial owned and, and managed businesses, such as recapitalizations, acquisitions, um, uh, any other type of monetization event, um, debt refinancings, uh, et cetera. Uh, across a variety of industries, I would say that if you were to pie chart, what they invest in, it's mostly uh, business services, and the next biggest would likely be niche manufacturing. But I think given the legacy of our growth equity strategy being our flagship strategy, um, you know, we're, we're partner-based, right? One of my partners in the buyout strategy affectionately calls our, our mezzanine strategy mequity, right? Because we, we approach it with very much the same private equity partner approach. It just happens to be structured as debt. Um, and then the newest st strategy in this family, which was founded in late 2013, is the New Spring Holdings strategy. And we founded that to be um, a little bit different than a traditional buyout strategy. It's really designed to deploy a permanent capital solution for investors and entrepreneurs in the lower middle market, which is hard to, to come by these days becoming more popular, but when it was founded, it was somewhat differentiated as, as, as sort of a structure. Um, so we're a holding company and our capital uh, is, is entrusted to us uh, for the long term. And we've made a concentrated portfolio of four business units, if you will, to function um, really as a partner to owners over a journey of scale through both acquisition and organic growth. And so, while we're a lower middle market buyout strategy, another way to really sort of refer to us is a diversified holding company that's main strategic differentiator is um, uh, acquisitions. And so um, we've got four platforms to date. Um, we've got a platform in the last mile logistics space uh, one called US Pack Logistics. We've got a platform in the managed services voice and data space called Magna5. We've got um, a financial services and technology company called Financeware. And then uh, our newest platform is E3 Sentinel, which is a government services business that we first acquired in, um, uh, in September. And so um, you know, I think I, where, where Brian characterized many of the, the characteristics we look for in these companies, I would say for us, and maybe even across all four, right? Mm -hmm. We're operators by, by training, right? By background as a firm. And so we appreciate the side of the table that our entrepreneurs sit on. But we too invest really alongside of our entrepreneurs, right? And so while we may be control owners, we require in each one of our platforms, industry natives, folks who, who whether they're the entrepreneur themselves, or they've identified, or we've collectively identified a platform that we can enter that will be led by somebody who really has that domain experience, because we don't pretend to know that where I think we add the value, right, is through our value creation structure at New Spring, where we've got functional experts uh, that we can deploy into our companies on a fractional basis. And this model is, is becoming somewhat, um, you know, popular across the board, but I think it's how we deploy these folks. And I think it's who they are uh, from their background at, 
we're not really asking the former CEO of a Fortune 100 company to come sit and have coffee with our CEO, right? We're talking to the former CIO of Comcast who's going to walk into a business and help them manage a network project, help them address highly strategic questions in a roll up your sleeves kind of way as a partner to our CEOs and management team. And we're helping to, to literally build the infrastructure of these businesses to give them the opportunity to scale and start to take the, 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 the elements that the CEOs don't necessarily want to do every day off their plate, redistribute that in an institutional way, in a scalable way and let these CEOs focus on building the business. And I think at the end of the day, in each one of our businesses, we try and apply the lens of stop playing not to lose and start playing to win. And I think that nuance and distinction is, is really important as we think about who we invest in. Got it. That, that's helpful. And, um, you know, it's, this is a really interesting strategy and one that we're seeing more in the lower middle market. I, it, I presume you have a longer longer runway than your typical uh, private equity firm with this, you know, holding you know holding company more permanent structure. It, you know, could you shed a little bit of light on on kind of runway, how long that runway could be, and yeah. kind of the the scale at which you try to build up these platform companies? Absolutely. So um, our our runway, for instance. Is, is really indefinite, right? I think the way we've designed this holding company and, and it, it's really about alignment of, of optimization, right? In a traditional fund structure, in the lower middle market buyout world, many times you requ you're required to sell an asset likely before it's ready where your cash flow is just starting to de-risk and your platform is really just hitting that optimal element because you're ready to go raise the next fund, right? And I think what we've tried to do is, is abstract that issue. That's no longer something that will influence whether or not you sell a company. We're not here to say we're gonna hold companies forever just because we can. We're here to say that we've removed an exogenous force that would otherwise influence a sale to let us focus on when monetization really makes sense. Has there been a shift in the industry? Have we hit our, frankly, capacity on ability or interest in managing that size of business, right? We, like we've talked about here, are focused on the lower middle market, right? If we owned a $750 million business, it's very different than owning a $30 million business. And if there are components of that that it's better off in someone else's hands, then let's monetize. And so the way we think about it is, and, and I think our growth brethren, frankly, take this approach just more naturally in, in your, you, you have a duration that's a little bit longer than traditional private equity. Um, you know, we don't have to sell. We sell when it's right for the business because building a business is never a straight line. Well, I think what Lee touches on also specific to the holding strategy, you know, I think a lot of those um, aspects touch on. I think uh, 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 an investor return or an LP perspective, right? Absolutely. There's also a whole nother perspective uh, on the management team's side of things that I think is equally powerful, mm -hmm. right? We're seeing in the market, just as this industry matures, uh, very, very attractive platforms and assets and companies out there that are now on their third, fourth, fifth uh, kind of sponsor <laughs> transition. Yeah. And uh, that, that can be very disruptive it could be very inefficient, uh, especially from a tax uh, standpoint, um, and it could be very distracting uh, for companies. And I think what Holdings has created is a very elegant solution to that. Yeah. And uh, I'll give you a quick example, right? You, RG, you asked um, sort of, is there something that we could point to? Um, New Spring Holdings today in aggregate is, um, is about a half a billion dollars in revenue, right? And, and, it, and w our, one of our older, or I guess not even that old, but um, an investment we made in about 2015 um, is a big contributor to that. Uh, we acquired a small business um, with the family who founded it and was running it, uh, the, the Glasman family. And, um, you know, we went on a journey with them to grow their business. And our goal was, look, we, we bought 30 million of revenue, right? Let's try and make that 100 million in five years. It sounds like a reasonable sort of goal to set. Well, we accomplished that goal through both organic growth and acquisition 
in under two years. We were a $120 million platform with them uh, three, about three years after we, we made our initial investment. And that came through four acquisitions. It came through significant infrastructure builds. It came through uh, the family still driving much of that growth. And then we acquired yet another business, a big $100 million business, and, and started to really design a platform to continue to add scale to that. Right. And so it goes to show that many times now that we're four plus years into an asset, um, sponsors may not say, hey, look, let's keep investing. Let's keep making the right decisions about building a technology platform to support the services that we offer, et cetera, because it's time to sell. We're still making those investments because they're the right decision for long term enterprise value. Got it. And I presume the um, the backers um, that your capital source uh, is also on board with uh, you know providing you with that flexibility of of deciding when the return of capital will will happen or when when the or I should say when the bulk of the return of capital. That's will right. Happen. And so so we are um, backed exclusively by institutional level financial family offices, right? So. Um, these are generally very successful entrepreneurs who understand the journey of building a business, right? So they're somewhat sympathetic to understanding how we invest their capital. Um, and uh, we are governed by a board um, that is representative of our investor base. We have representatives of our investors on that board. And so they're in the room helping us make those decisions. And, and, and did this emanate from? Um... In some of the you know partners uh, or you know founders of your firm are, are they kind of you know given that they were former operators? Um, yeah. So um, great network. question, RJ. Um, uh, so we, Mike DiPiano and Mark Letterman, co-founders of the firm, had a deliberate sort of asset allocation kind of mentality. Right. We started with our growth equity strategy and technology. We added healthcare. We added mezzanine. But you know our investor base wanted ac access, and we have a firm-wide deal sourcing um, uh, um, practice that was sourcing all different types of deals. And we were we we did not have at the time before the strategy began a lower middle market buyout opportunity. And so in bringing buyouts to New Spring, um, we added a partner by the name of Skip Maynard. Skip ran funds, but before that, Skip was an entrepreneur himself. And Mike DiPiano and our partner base were also entrepreneurs and understood the lens that they wanted to invest in that way. They wanted to do it differently. And so it was driven by Skip and, and Mike and the team coming together saying, if we're going to do this, let's do it our way. Um, and it was tough in the beginning, right, to design it. It's new. We didn't really have docs to go after. Um, so uh, it was driven by that operator mentality. And our, our other partner in New Spring Holdings, Jim Ashton, was the CEO of SunGuard Financial Systems, which was a two plus billion dollar unit of SunGuard where you know he was an operator, right? That's really, he just, he, he managed people and business units and saw the New Spring Holdings strategy much like how he ran SunGuard. Yeah, and RJ, just to expand on that a little bit, um... I mean, you, you, you pointed out, I think, a very important thing to us, which is that the influence of that operator mindset, yeah. um, you know, certainly I think you can see that and how deliberately we've uh, structured and designed our control buyout platform. But frankly, um, the same has been true for all four of our strategies, right? Um, even today, you know, after 20 years, over half uh, the senior leadership for each of our four platforms uh, is comprised of individuals that come from, you know, that former operator, CEO, and entrepreneur background. Um, that mindset's really ingrained into everything that we do, how we work with companies, how we um, uh, partner with companies. And thankfully, it's, you know, frankly, you know, ingrained enough where it rubs off <laughs> on career investors, yeah. you know, like Lee and myself, right? So uh, that 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 mindset, that background, right, in terms of how we were f founded and who we were founded by, um, very much uh, remains like a key theme, uh, day in and day out at New Spring. Yeah, and I I think it's 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 really important um, understanding that because um, 
the, 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 the capital world is getting a lot more competitive. It seems like every, every day Certainly. I'm reading a new story yep. of a new uh, growth fund um, or, or a new, you know, lower middle market fund. Um, and, and it's, it's not uh, uncommon that you'll have, uh, you know, one or two people spin out from a fund and, and start their own, you know, new fund. So it, it, it's, it, you know, it's, it's competitive. We, um, it, you know, just the other day we were meeting with um, an investor who we've known for some time and they were, you know, they were talking about how they, you know, the last two, three deals, unfortunately fell away from them. They were just out competed. Um, and so to, fa- to have that kind of differentiation is, is key. Um, you know, maybe on, on the growth side, um, you know, how do you, how do you find, or, or, you know, I guess two questions. One, are you seeing that competition or are you just, you have kind of a different set of criteria where competition isn't as, you know, as fierce or, or prevalent. Um, and then two, if, if you are competing, um, you know, what do you think are the, the kind of key things that, uh, you know, enable you to, you know, to win over, you know, uh, other funds? Yeah, no, I, I appreciate the question. And, and the answer to the first is absolutely, right? It, you know, I think every year that passes, um, irrespective of how, you know, the markets are doing more broadly, you know, this industry is maturing, right? It's becoming more efficient, more competitive. And we take that competition very, very seriously. And, and um, you know, I think for, for us, uh, what we do is, is we, we try and look inward, right? We try and build the firm in a way that's very services oriented, right? Um, you know, an example of that was touched on earlier by, by Lee, right? In terms of uh, talking a little bit about our value creation team. Uh, so, you know, about five plus years ago, I think you, what you saw across the industry, especially on the, the, the more control oriented side of the industry, um, you would see uh, a bunch of operating groups pop up, right? And that type of uh, uh, value creation uh, approach adopted by a lot of uh, buyout firms and private equity firms in the market. And the first iteration of that was really done uh, from a sector or an industry standpoint, right? A, a subject matter expert or an experienced executive uh, that was very experienced in, you know, XYZ industry, whether it be last mile logistics or specialty manufacturing or something even uh, uh, more specific than that. And as we thought about better ways to kind of add value to our portfolio, uh, we decided to, to take that model and actually take a very different approach to it, right? Actually build that bench of value added uh, ex- executives, right? Um, really on a functional basis as opposed to a sector basis. What we saw that was prevalent in the industry was um, actually having a lot of these folks really end up just being faces on a website um, and not utilized as fully as, as, as they could be or were initially designed to be. And, and we looked at the needs of our portfolio, especially within growth, and we tried to solve the problem of, of earlier stage, younger companies that are struggling with uh, you know, tackling specific functional issues within their organization, whether it be moving from just having a VP of marketing uh, to um, actually kind of gaining the scale where the investment in a full-time CMO uh, was helpful or uh, needing some coaching, right, and some supplementation for existing roles uh, that were there. And, and so we designed and built this value creation team uh, really on a functional basis to kind of fulfill those gaps that we saw uh, going on uh, every day within our portfolio, uh, just as, as, as one example. Um, other ways we, we, we try and compete, and this really applies across the board, um, we uh, have really invested very heavily in terms of our business development engine, right? We're leveraging data uh, much more uh, aggressively than we were uh, just a few years ago. We've invested in the team much more aggressively than we, than we were uh, a few years ago as well. All designed to kind of build these relationships at the ground level with entrepreneurs, uh, with other influencers in each of the geographies that that, that are a major fo- focus for us. Got it. And uh, d- do you find that it's you know really over time, um, you know, you're able to 
you know, develop re these relationships with CEOs. And so maybe, you know, where, you know, you, you'll, you'll meet a team and you won't necessarily transact, um, you know, soon after, you know, meeting that, that, that management team, but, but you will two to three years down the road. So is it, is it really kind of that, that long lead gen that you look to, where you look to develop uh, relationships over time? Absolutely. Um, w without going into specific examples or, or, or specific company names, you know, I'm thinking of, of, of one in which uh, we actually uh, had tracked the business for the, uh, over five years, frankly. Um, over five years, we had tracked the company, I think, through uh, a number of different phases, uh, including both gaining addition, you know, additional scale over time, but also transitioning away from what initially was a 100% uh, perpetual license-based business model into one that was predominantly subscription over time. Uh, until five years in, we finally pulled the trigger and, and invested in their Series D. Um, you know, that uh, I think is a terrific example, right, of a trusted partnership and relationship developed over time. And at the end of the day, um, we want to compete uh, for investments and partnerships on a personal level. Right, where um, we have had the benefit, right, of understanding a business in a way that others haven't, right, in a way of developing a relationship and having better insight into the challenges and the opportunities within that business uh, in ways that others haven't. And we feel uh, we have a high degree of conviction that, you know, when we're wearing uh, the hat of the entrepreneur or the particular company in question, that um, there's high conviction that we are the right partner, right, to basically add value and maximize uh, the opportunities ahead for that company. So, you know, rarely can that happen in a, uh, you know, few week, you know, timeline, right? Rarely can that happen, um, you know, I think when uh, you're just getting to know a company uh, when they happen to be raising capital, right? Uh, those investments and that groundwork really have to happen uh, months, if not years, before that event. Got it. Thanks. Thanks for that. Well, you know, this has been, and I know we're bumping up against the the end of uh, our our time here. This has been a, a great conversation, and I know that uh, one that our our audience will, you know, find insightful. I guess before we sign off, you know, anything um, that we didn't cover that you'd you'd like to mention, um, Lee or Brian. I don't think so. I appreciate you guys taking some time with us today. Yeah, then this has been this has been a lot of fun. It's uh, it's our pleasure. So I guess with with that, you know, we'll sign off. Thanks again uh, for taking the time, and uh, look forward to talking again soon.